We're ready. Do you want me to record this? Sure. <laughs> See if I can get three screens this time. I'm surprised you didn't post that live. <laughs> I couldn't recreate that if I wanted to. All right, we're ready. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Turn that down. Um, let's see if uh, we can do this today just with one screen. Let's see if I can get through. So um, I know we probably, this was an all staff invite. And so I'll kind of kick this off with um, the second part of, of today is just going to be uh, largely a Q&A FAQs around um, synchronous learning and grading and attendance and so on. But I, I did want everyone in the in our county, in our district, to, to hear the same message as we get ready to kick off the uh, first phase of new learning on Monday. The uh, I wanted to thank the efforts from everyone to get us to this point. It has been a, uh, a, a crazy summer, um, and, and here we are, August 24th. You know, we originally said, oh, we'll get our kids back to school early since we left early. And uh, all it did was increase the, uh, the stress on our system, but um, we have we pulled it off. Next week is going to be a week like no other um, mm -hmm. in our district and across the state, uh, no doubt about it. Um, we you know we started off with power school crashing on Monday morning, um, and then another brief outage, uh, and then of course power school is going to have maintenance this weekend because that makes sense. Sorry, that was dripping sarcasm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> However, with all that, uh, patience next week, being supportive of each other, being supportive of that tech department that um, we did not add any employees to in the midst of making sure that all of our students have technology in their hands. And now all of our families are at home needing support. And of course, all of you in your classrooms. Now, I believe we've done everything we could to prepare for Monday. I can't thank uh, Ms. Reynolds and her team enough for what they have pulled off and what they've accomplished. And um, I think that uh, I couldn't be more proud of the effort across our district with our principals, our central office, and of course our teachers and all of our support staff as we get ready to move forward. Um, I just wanted to put that on next week. Come anticipate a rough week. We'll get through it and um, we'll gather information and we'll try to take care of our community. We want to take care of you as teachers. Just, just be patient. Um, we don't have a tech to go into every building. Um, we, we're going to do our absolute best. They'll be out on the ground. They'll be working with you, and um, we'll get through it. And if things don't go well one day, it's okay. We're going to turn around, and we'll make it better by the end of the day. I think you saw as good of an example of that. We had our convocation the other day. Um, that I didn't get as stressed out as anyone. I tried to tell if I was faking or if that was real. And it was a mix of both. So. With that, I just, um, again, I wanted to thank you for the effort that you put in to get us ready for school. It's not often that you hear from this, an all-group staff meeting with superintendent twice outside of convocation in the end of the year. Um, but we'll get together many times um, through the course of this pandemic until we get back to what seems like something normal again. But uh, again, thank you all for what you're doing. I appreciate the work. If you are not a classroom teacher, a teacher's aide, or someone um, that falls into those categories, you can hop off now uh, it, or you can stay on. It's up to you. But if you want to hear questions like about dress code for virtual instruction and what early release days look, feel, again, feel free to stay on, but that's what we're going to jump into here, into at this time. So I'm going to take a 10 second pause and you can hop off and then we'll get started. Okay, we are on, live, camera, here we go. <laughs> All right, Renee, uh, what's the first question? All right, first question that we had come in to us is what are Fridays like today going to look like across the district now that all K-12 schools are on an early release schedule during this remote learning? Okay, so what a great opportunity to, to really work on our craft. You heard me mention that before, so I'm looking at it the same way. So early release days, um, high schools hold your breath. You're still going to do largely. You're, you're going to have your own time um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to start off about 1230 every 
every Friday, we're going to have a district level meeting and like some, and if we need a district meeting, we're going to have one. Like we still need to go over policies. Um, we'll probably have Kevin Honeycutt come back. We're going to do some other things that are going to be meaningful work, things that apply district wide. If we don't have something, we're not going to ever meet for the sake of meeting. Um, but at, we're going to go about 50 minutes, 1230 to 130, and we're going to push this out. I'm doing this verbal. I'm not going to push this out, but we're still fine tuning a few things. Um, and then from 130 to 230-ish, we're going to have district level PLCs where we're going to have groups of teachers with common uh, interests, common subjects, and you're going to meet. And then the 2.30 to 3.30 time slot is going to be a building level. Piece. <laughs> we're going to work on your data usage. We're going to do your uh, MTSS work. Um, so, again, it's going to go you know, district. Uh, it's going to go large, big district picture. Then we're going to go into district PLCs with common subject, common area. And then we're going to get into, like, our data work at the building level. Um, that's our plan. Again, we will be nimble and, and we'll approach this to, to make sure we're meeting the needs of everyone, but we're going to maximize our time because we have a great opportunity here to come together. We've never had that before on a regular basis um, across the district. Um, so we can have our, our middle school teachers and our elementary people are working across. So again, we're really excited about the opportunity we have on those early release Fridays and uh, we'll tweak our schedules and make sure things are ready to roll. Yep, and I think just to reiterate again, Matt, like what you just said, K-8, we're going to be working on developing that framework. High schools will be kind of modeling what you've been doing and kind of we are the ones who kind of were used to that early release schedule on Fridays. So, you know, we're going to work for still having some district time where we can all collaborate together or we can push out, again, having Danielle Dickey come back or a Kevin Honeycutt. So we want that time to still be able to have everybody together, but Fridays at the high school level, will look more similar to what you've been doing. And then K-8, this is brand new to you. We're super excited that now we get to have this opportunity for you guys to collaborate the same way and then do some vertical planning all the way through. So just to reiterate that. We'll push that out. Um, you'll get a formal schedule next week. You'll get links to the meets, to the meetings and so on and so forth. K-8, we've done this before. You know the routine. We're just going to do it a lot more often than we have. All right. Do teachers need to follow a dress code for virtual instruction? So we did have that question kind of submitted to us and it came up on a, a couple different schools websites or, or FAQ documents that they were posing. But um, I, I, I'm going to rely on a, a colleague and friend, Melissa Lacano at the high school, who I asked permission to share hers. But she kind of posted that question uh, uh, out to Facebook and, and was like, man, this is different. So do we dress up and, and make ourselves presentable? And, and I think Melissa kind of summed it up so well. And in her Facebook post, she's like, thanks for everybody who gave me advice. I, I felt good. I, I, if you're wondering what I did, I dressed like if I were in person in front of my kids in my classroom. It felt good. I felt good. Um, I've even talked about it during my classes and I had a choice to show up. And so her like first lesson with her kids was this was about making a choice about how do we show up? And so she made the choice to dress professionally as if she were in front of her kids. And you are, you're in front of your kids every day synchronously. So make it a choice to be the professionals you are and show up and dress up and do amazing things. So thanks to Melissa for letting us share a little bit about um, like her social media posts. She just made the choice to dress up and show up. And we encourage all of you to, to treat it as if you are the professionals you are. Dress accordingly. Again, casual Fridays can be casual Fridays, but keep in mind you're in front of a camera in front of your kids. And so we encourage you to, to treat it as such. Our next question, Dr. Lutz, was about a minimum number of graded assignments per week at the different grade levels. Are we going to do anything similar to that this go round? So some of these questions for me, like, boom, I, I'm very comfortable answering. And then I'm, but I, I'm like, oh, did that come too quickly to me? Uh, so I'll bounce them off of, of people that I have a lot of respect for and say, OK, so tell me about how many graded assignments. If we put a minimum on here or a maximum, does that make sense? And. I feel like here's right. We're asking you to teach as close to normal as we always have. And so therefore, one week you're going to have more assignments than others. I think it's appropriate. We're going to teach it like we normally would teach. Now, you're going to doesn't that counter what we did in the spring? We were trying to provide some structure to the spring in a time when we weren't really sure where things were going. We did not have a plan, nor did anyone. Um, we did a whole lot better building that plane while we were flying it than some. Um, but I want you to go back and you're teaching. And so if 
what I really want you to put your teacher when you're thinking about is this assignment worth doing? Does this help my does this help my student learn the subject? Is this something that they need to do outside of the classroom, or are they ready for that? Rather than saying we need a minimum number of assignments or a maximum number of assignments, and so that's where we're going to begin. Where we're, we're going to, you know, of course, as a classroom teacher, you always had that latitude, and you're going to continue to have that flexibility. So, in a Google Meet, what is the expectation of synchronous learning, Renee? So we get a lot, and there have been a lot of discussions, and building principals have brought us back lots of discussion about synchronous instruction, and what are what are the expectations, and what are we looking for with synchronous instruction? So to, to sum that part up, so synchronous means that all teachers are logging in in real time, like this right now. This is synchronous. We are live. We are in front of you in real time, having some type of direct contact with you. Um, every bell, every day. During synchronous instructions, it can look like, again, the experts in the field. You are logging on every period, every day with your kids. Some days that looks like direct instruction where I am teaching a new concept in front of my kids and providing that direct new instruction to them. Other days when I log in with my kids, I'm going to review what we did yesterday and say that today's a carryover of that activity. And so for today, I'm going to review what we did yesterday. We're going to take a look at where you are in the production of a product or whatever that is. And I'm going to be here to answer any questions that you have, or I might pull a small group aside and do small group instruction. We just want to make sure what, what synchronous is not is I've recorded myself teaching. I just throw it onto the website and say, hey, log on if you have any questions. Um, that's kind of not the intent here. If we're trying to really mirror what a typical day is like, those kids are coming into your classroom and you're having live direct contact with those kids every day. And we want that to be mirrored. In this very short time um, for our K-5 folks to know our early college has been live our high school went live and our middle school did a test run of just some logging in and being live and great feedback thus far about kids wanting to log in and wanting to see them and wanting to be live. We want that momentum to continue. If you say you can log in if you want to, we're going to lose that interaction with kids. And so we are saying synchronous you're logging in, you're participating live with your kids, it's gonna look differently based on what your content delivery is for that day. And that's okay, because it looks different in your classroom every day. But we don't want to get out of the habit of we're logging in, being live with our kids every bell, every day. And so we just wanna set that expectation for you that this isn't like last spring where we kind of recorded ourselves, posted it and said, hey, whenever you can get to it, get to it. We know that some of that still exists for our families and we have to be cognizant of that, which is why we've kind of asked about recording and posting it into your Google Classroom. But the expectation is you're logging in, you're being live with your kids every day. What that direct instruction looks like, what that small group looks like will differ depending on what you've got going on in your classrooms. But we, we expect that you're live with your kids every day, every bell. That's a promise we made to our parents, and um, we're gonna we're gonna keep that, and we're gonna, gonna provide as much normalcy here as we can. And we're asking you to get into a very uncomfortable place, and I recognize that. And just like doing this today, so we're trying to model what what we would expect at the same time. And again, when we look at different places, different districts. Everybody's doing a little bit different thing. Um, we have we believe we have the capabilities to to pull this off on, with our infrastructure, and so therefore. We're going to continue down that path. Oh, now for the one of the favorite items of my week, in the last week, is attendance. Um, all right, I'm going to do the K-5 one, and then I'm going to turn over 612 to, to Renee. All right, K-5, attendance. We're going to work with our kids. you got multiple sessions. We're going to figure out attendance and what looks like good attendance, who's there. Our, our K-5 world, we're going to be more dependent on parents. The kids are going to be less self-regulated. Um, we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to figure out what attendance looks like in the K-5 world with a lot of flexibility around that because it makes a lot of sense being that it's hard to expect a first grader to log on if nobody's there to help them. Probably, unless they're really, anyhow, I think we know what we mean. But we need to give our kids time and our parents flexibility. So we have rethought 
our 612 expectation here based on the feedback that we've received from everyone um, in terms of how does that attendance work at the high school and middle school level, and we're going to try something. I am going to say this. Flexibility is key, and I think it could be something like this. Teachers that were flexible with their kids around learning and getting work in and working with issues are going to continue to be flexible. I'm asking you all to become more flexible as we roll through this, although we're going to tighten up our attendance guidelines for 612. And to that, I kick it to you, Renee. All right. So we heard your feedback loud and clear. And um, uh, for my high school folks and my middle school folks who are doing period atten uh, attendance, what that's going to look like. And Susan Sawyer sent out uh, a beautiful email that kind of laid it out. And I think everybody understood once we kind of shared, like, this is DPI's attendance policy. Attendance can be taken based off of uh, live synchronous uh, participation in your live instruction or work completion. Um, I think we put the onus on that Friday in hopes that we were trying to mirror what the um, spring semester looked like, and that's causing angst among you, and we don't want it to be that way. And so if we're going to say we're going to treat this like the regular school day, attendance is going to be done daily. I log into first bell math class with my teacher. That first bell math class sees me, marks me present because I'm there. I don't log into first bell with my math teacher. They don't see me. They mark me absent. If we had an assignment due that afternoon uh, for class participation, then I go in and I log in and complete that by that same evening at 1159, let's say that same day, then they can go back and mark me present, but it's daily. No more of like this, we're going to wait till Friday and change everything. We don't want this to be too cumbersome of a process on you. So let's treat it like daily attendance like we normally would. First bell, you log in, your kids are there, mark anybody who's not there absent that evening, the kids that complete the work for that day, we go back and change that attendance and just keep it that simple as daily uh, keeping track of attendance. We just asked, like Dr. Lutz just said, have some flexibility, work with your kids, work with your families. We're going to ask families to make sure they're notifying you of absences or reasons why they can't get in or internet being down and those types of things. But we know just in this short window, as we monitor social media, that people are trying to log in, internet's kicking them off. I think some of you as teachers had a day today where you couldn't get into Google Classroom or Google Meets wasn't working. So we just need to be flexible and, and not look for ways to penalize kids, but make sure we're looking for ways to help kids and families. And I know that you all I'll do that uh, tremendously. So that's that one caveat. We will send out a formal email after today's uh, meet with you guys, just walking you through that expectation for attendance again. Thank you. Well, we thought it was appropriate for Sandy to join us for the protocols for video learning. And so Sandy, do teachers need to ask permission to record sessions? Uh, anytime you hit the record button on your Google Meet, it is gonna come up with um, it's digital citizenship, you know, uh, modeling, asking uh, you to notify your people that it is going to be um, recorded and um, bringing that up and highlighting it with your kids is certainly uh, best practices. It's also going to show them on their end that this session is being recorded. We, of course, want to give people choice. So parents will have an opt-out form that is going to be made available if they do not wish for their child to be recorded on a live session. Um, we're asking teachers to record their sessions because, especially as Dr. Lutz brought up, the K-5 world, we may have kids in daycare who don't have the capability to do the assignments and the lessons um, synchronously and may have to do them in the evenings with their parents at home. So they would need to have that instructional video available to them. Um, so we are at, that's why we're asking for the videos to be um, created and then posted on the Google Classrooms for those families to be able to do things asynchronously anytime. Um, we are encouraging uh, staff members to always pin themselves to the main screen or change their view, their settings um, view so that they are minimizing the number on the side who are showing and um, minimizing um, anything that's acknowledging, a, you know, student names or things like that. But we're going to play this by ear. Um, we think the kids really want to be seen and heard and see and hear each other. But we do want to give parents that that um, opt out if that is what they, they choose to do and we'll get that form to you. So as far as cameras being on during direct instruction, is it optional small group instruction? And I'm going to turn that over to Renee here in a second. But 
in terms of us as adults, when we move into our PLC work and so on, it's going to be an expectation that the cameras are on. Um, I, For example, when we meet with our principals right now, everybody's camera's on. It's so much easier to work when we can see that. So for the adults, we're going to be camera on and we're going to be interactive. Um, but for our kids, Renee? So I think we, we have gotten a lot of questions about requiring cameras to be turned on um, when we interact with students. And I go back to the very basics. This is about building trust and about building relationships with kids. And I think the more that we focus on making sure we do those things, the more we won't have to say, is this a matter of do we make them turn on cameras because they'll want to turn on the cameras. And I think a, a lot of you who are already in live instruction or seeing kids want to turn on their cameras and interact with one another. They miss one another. They miss you guys. And so that's happening naturally. But requiring kids to turn on cameras is a little bit more tricky. And I think that we need to tread tentatively over top of that because we don't know their environments. And, and many kids may not want you to see what that environment is at home. Um, and may not be comfortable themselves on there. So just because we don't make them turn on their camera doesn't mean we can't interact with them. And we don't then call on them to say, hey, Susie, what do you think about this? And ask them to participate still, even though we can't see their uh, face on the camera. So um, if we're worried about the, I click it and turn it on and you see my icon, but then I head into the other room to do something completely different or I go to work or I leave the house or whatever the case may be, then that interaction and engagement is extremely important. But we also, I think that all of you recognize that some kids will not be comfortable with you seeing what may be going on behind them. And maybe that's for our safety as well. We don't know what brothers or siblings might walk past through without shirts on or shorts on or who knows what. Um, but just, again, it's about building relationships with kids and, and building that trust so that hopefully they do want to engage and be live with you. But I, we just caution about that requirement of every kid has to turn on their camera um, so that you can see what's going on because they're not in school with you. And so they're having to open up their world to you that may be a little hard for them to do just from the get go. So um, keep that in mind as you're going on, but keep engaging them just because I see their avatar or their bitmoji or their whatever on there. I still should call on them and make sure that they're engaging and participating as well. The next question, Dr. Lutz, is about clarifying the required the RW required workday remote learning. So it's an RW RL on our calendar or an OW RL on our calendar for the optional workday uh, remote learning days. So those that we're looking forward beyond what's the forest in front of us, thank you for bringing this up. And we realize that yet again, we have a challenge within our calendar. Um, I think so. Again, we had re we had. Uh, remote learning days built into the calendar. I think we're taking care of those right now. So here's what we're going to do. I think our first one's in late September. I'll give you an update on that somewhere in the near future. It doesn't seem to me to make a whole lot of sense to have a remote learning day when we're already having remote learning days. So we're going to figure out what that day looks like. When And whoever brought that up, thank you. You made the list, and we'll get back to it. All right, yeah. another one that's up there is substitutes. Um so, yeah, look, we know that, and I'm going to come right back to you here. Sorry, Renee. No, you're good. I'll come back to you in a second. So the questions come up, how are we even training our substitutes? What are we doing with our substitutes? And, and they're great questions, um, and we depend on our substitutes. However, this is a different type of environment that we're in, and it doesn't. we don't believe that it makes sense to have a substitute for a day. When we get into extended absences, well, that's when we're going to look into getting a substitute. But if you're doing a typical day of, uh, and you knew you had a doctor's appointment that you can't, that you have to get to, you're going to prepare your lesson plans regardless of whether or not, you know, we were a remote learning or we were in school. So to caveat to this is that if you are providing synchronous learning from home, then you would not need to have a, a leave day. Does that make, I, we'll kind of work through this, but that's kind of the general rule we'll follow. Again, if you have to go to, to Norfolk to get to a doctor's appointment, you obviously can't do synchronous learning that day because you will, you'll be out. And so we'll be working through that. But as far as substitutes, we'll look at long-term subs or different chunks of time. And we do want to work with our substitutes, many of which are somewhat leery right now uh, of jumping on board, but we'll work through um, getting them trained. You want to add anything, Renee? 
Yeah, I mean, again, you can imagine as difficult as this for uh, this is for us to navigate who have training in Google and all those things, having substitutes jump in and trying to cover is another whole ball of wax. So again, it's about communication. It's about communicating with your students and parents about your attendance. If there's something that's going on that you can't make it for, you're not going to be synchronous and your administrators, right? Because uh, they're going to watch and be monitoring what's going on in the Google Classrooms as well as the synchronous learning in, uh, that's going to take place with your Google Meets. So just communicate, 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 communicate about what's going on and making sure we're all on the same page uh, so that we can help each other out throughout all of this. But substitutes will be used only if there's an emergency of a, an extended period of time in which we're going to have to cover classes. Um, otherwise, you have you know your Google Classroom. You can plan in advance as much as possible there will always be those times where you all of a sudden that night start feeling really crummy and wake up and just can't get logged in and have to take a sick day. And that's okay too. It's just about communicating or communicating with your administrators who can then send that message out in the event that you're not able to. All right. Our, other, our next question is about Google Meet behavior and consequences. I know we, we as educators always play the what if game with ourselves. Like what if a kid gets online and does this? Or what if a parent in the background does this um, with our live Google Meet? Oh, or if, when. when, right. If, if and when. We know it happens and we've already read stories about it happening in other places. So we just need you to know as a classroom teacher, uh, teacher assistant, if there's somebody that's acting out on a Google Meet and the behavior is such that it's taking away from your ability to provide instruction to the rest of your students, it needs to be reported. Um, we're going to still walk through Educator's Handbook with all of our administrators again. You have resources that will help provide some training for those of you that need to do that, but report it to your administrators if you're having issues with students or parents. Uh, perhaps in the background with Google Meets. Like, we need to know about those things. Those are still things that we can handle and provide disciplinary action if we need to moving forward. Uh, like we the just, plan, right, Renee, was to, you know, to bring them to school. Right. We're going to do reverse suspensions where, no, I'm just teasing. We, we, were, we were teasing about that. Like, what happens when we suspend a kid from the Google Meet and they're already at home? But no, um, we'll, we'll handle those things. We need to deal with them and nip them in the bud um, as if they were in class and, and we need to handle those things for you guys. So just bring them to the attention, make sure it's not something that's going on that we're not aware of. Yeah. And, and if I could just interject, uh, mm -hmm. it's so important just as a classroom teacher, as, as uh, Dr. Lutz and, and um, Renee have talked about over and over again, we're trying to make it seem as normal as a classroom as possible. So you're gonna set up your expectations right from the beginning. You can't control what's happening in the home environment, but you need to let them know that this is what I expect from you and this is what you can expect from me. And the same thing with parents. I think the majority of them will, will you know, just be happy to be involved and be getting this instruction live. Um, and then you'll be able to deal with some of those situations and probably get a majority of them back on track with just uh, communication and understanding. But certainly we want to be um, involved in helping in any way possible. And um, we'll be coming with some more training also for, uh, for GoGuardian for staff members to be able to utilize that resource as well. And again, hanging back off that last question, if we're having to bump kids out of class or you're having to hang up, let's just say you have a situation in which you have to hang up or excuse a kid out of class because of that, we have to document that. And and, and you know as well as most that if that student um, is an exceptional child, that's important that we have that documentation as well and are communicating that with our case managers. And again, our administrators have to know if that's going on. We'll, we'll figure this out. Um, no one's ever, as far as I know, the synchronous learning has never occurred on a large scale. Most of us have taken an online course before. You never even see the professor's face. You never saw your teacher's face. Um, if you do NCVPS, you don't. It's all distance. You don't have any of this. So um, to, to that end, have some fun with this. Be, be positive and just... I know that there's grace, know that we're going to work through it, and I could not be more impressed with the amount of care and effort that you all put in to preparing to kick us off, and I love that you just went with, let's have like kind of a, uh, a soft start week, and let's figure this out, and let's build relationships, and I think some of the best um, relationship building activities we've seen yet just occurred. I think we might have learned a whole lot 
from how we should be reaching out to our kids in the future and our families. And I really think we're going to come out of this in a better place when, when we reach the end. I can't thank you enough and um, have a wonderful weekend. Get some rest as we gear up for school and uh, we will see you next week. Bye.